Okay, everybody, I think that uh, we can uh, resume our conversation. And um, we're picking up uh, on the next set of uh, readings um, in the course. And um, I, uh, let's see if I remember what it's, uh, I think I remember what it's called. Yes, uh, we, we've talked about conformity and isolation. And in a way, that is a perfect um, uh, lead-in to the conversation we want to have this week, which on the reading list is called selves, uh, or we could call it the self, plural of the self, selves <clears throat> and interaction. And uh, it, it lends itself to the prior week's discussion in that we're trying to explain conformity. Uh, that's another way of putting it. That is, uh, by, by investigating or thinking about what the self is uh, and how interaction works among people, maybe we will have a way of understanding, my bet is we will, how conformity works and why you saw what you saw, why the Milgram experiment has the outcome it has, why the ASH experiment has the outcome uh, that, that it has. Uh, and um, how to understand uh, all of that. Well, uh, the most important uh, thing that we see when we look at the world uh, is ourself. And uh, I remember uh, a funny story. I was in a locker room once uh, in California, and a guy came out of the sauna, and he was uh, an older man, and he sat on the bench in a very thoughtful mood, and he said, I may not be much, but I'm all I ever think about. And uh, I think that uh, that is more generally true. Uh, it's, I think, true of the people in this room. I think of all the things we think about, the thing we think about most is ourselves. And, uh, but that's not any simple, straightforward thing. And indeed, it's a very complicated thing. And probably we are the only creatures on the earth who do think about ourselves. That is, we introspect. We are not only an actor in this world, but we are an object of our own thinking about our own acting. And there's a lot of debate in the social sciences and between sociologists and biologists about what is distinctly human. And uh, all of you have had, many of you at least, have had pets, and particularly people who have had dogs, uh, genuinely believe that their dogs are human-like. And indeed, I think that I've come to learn that the other creatures in the world have more in common with us than I used to think they did. But nonetheless, this capacity to think um, in particular ways, we are the thinking things. And one of the things we think about that does mark us off from other creatures seems to be the fact that we can think about ourselves uh, and we are therefore introspective. I can think about me and you can think about you. Uh, and that's probably not true for Lassie uh, and other talented dogs um, and other talented creatures uh, who are non-human. So with all due respect, to the uh, non-human creatures, we seem to be outstanding uh, in this regard. The question then is, OK, well, how do we do that? Because in a way, it's a contradiction. How can something be both the subject, that is me thinking about whatever, uh, and the object at the same time? It seems an almost grammatical impossibility, um, as well as perhaps an existential impossibility. Yet we manage to do it. And the question is, how do we think about how we think about that, uh, how we think about ourselves? Well, um, we do it through, first of all, symbols. Uh, and words are symbols. Uh, th the very words I'm using as I make this case, as I'm in front of you, as I've been in front of you now numbers of times, talking about the chair that you're sitting on, uh, talking about of uh, famous uh, people, or not so famous, but famous to us sociologist type people, uh, these are all done in words, with words. 
And when you think about anything, your consciousness is filled with words. So you're thinking all the time with words which are symbols. Symbols meaning that there's a, th a thing like the word chair, C-H-A-I-R, and it stands for the very uh, object that you are resting your backside on. And when I use the word chair, something like that object is able to be invoked in your mind. When you think, when you dream, you are dreaming with these symbols. Uh, and also with signs like stop signs, um, which are it kind of like symbols. That is, they're things that stand in for something else. Through these symbols that are running through our mind, we have a capacity to interpret. And that's a word that sociologists use an awful lot and also use to, dis to demarcate differences between human beings and the other creatures. They, we don't think, interpret. They don't interpret the way we interpret. That is, we not only see a sign, like say even a stop sign, or the word on it that says stop, but we can process that and think, well, actually, it's a sign that says stop, but it was, I'm in someone's house. It's their idea of clever. Somebody somewhere along the way took the stop sign from the street or wherever else they got it, and now they've put it in the family room. Hardy har har, isn't that charming? But it doesn't mean that on my way to the bathroom, I'm to stop. So in the way that a robin, when the robin sees the red breast of the male robin coming right along, bop, bop, bopping along, there's a song about that, the robin stops right away because this is going to be action. And boom, out it comes. Innate fixed action patterns, it is sometimes called. Fixed action patterns, or what we otherwise might call instinct. There's not a kind of, wait a minute, this is a, a stop sign, all right, but this is in somebody's house. So it doesn't mean what it might otherwise mean if I were in a car uh, driving on the street. Uh, or if uh, there was a great forest fire and I had to move through this intersection in order to save my life and other people's lives. This means not stop in those cases. I interpret the world, look at all the little details, and act accordingly. So that's another wonderful talent that we have. We are interpreters, and we do it through this bouncing world of symbols in the form of words primarily. And those are the mechanisms uh, through which we um, fill our brain, fill our mind, including about ourselves. Now, how do we do it about ourselves? Well, I'm going to turn to this dead person, uh, 1931, uh, George Herbert Mead who was actually not a sociologist, but a professor of philosophy uh, at the University of Chicago. And um, I think his mark in philosophy is less important to philosophers than his mark in sociology is to sociologists. George Herbert Mead also is, although a great thinker, someone who actually didn't publish. Uh, in today's world, he would never get tenure at the University of Chicago or at NYU, we would have let him go probably after two years uh, because nothing was happening, we would say, about this guy. Uh, so what we know about the way he thought comes through the notes that his students took. Keep that in mind, by the way, as you're writing down what you're writing. And he has become a very important person by virtue of his students' notes, which have been published in various, uh, various forms. And the, the phrase that we associate with George Herbert Mead is this phrase, symbolic interaction. And hopefully by the end of today's class, those words will come alive and make more sense than they do um, at this moment upon your first uh, hearing of them. I like to tell the story of, um, uh, I'm sort of in fact mired in the story, 
of when I lived in a real house, a single family house. I had a driveway, I had a dog, I had a Volvo. I had all these things that I don't have anymore. And one day, um, I uh, come out of my driveway and I see that not my dog, but my neighbor's dog um, has shit in my driveway. And this happens really quite routinely with this uh, particular big dog. And um, I'm, I'm annoyed. And so uh, the dog comes running toward me to sniff me up and wagging its tail, happy dog. And I'm not happy at all because I'm rushing off to go teach or whatever else I'm doing. And um, now I've got to stop um, and get a shovel, which I kept near for this purpose, uh, and then get rid of the stuff and all of that. Uh, very unpleasant little activities. And so I pick up the newspaper, which is also in the driveway, and I see the dog, and I go like this to s swipe the dog. Not brutally, but you know, get it away. And because uh, I'm, I'm dealing with the, this, this pile of stuff, and I got this big dog, you know, being my pal. So I want to get rid of the dog. I pick it up like that. The dog's name was Daiquiri, by the way, after the drink. And I pick it up, and I'm about to swipe Daiquiri, and I see my neighbor who is on a slight incline above me where her front door is and her porch, she's coming out and she's about to wave to me. So now I got this issue on my hands of I'm about to hit her dog and she is giving me a friendly greeting. So what I do is my arm, which is coming down on the dog, instead goes up into a friendly, hi, how are you doing? Um, and, uh, and so uh, I've changed course, haven't I? Um, what's happened is, is that my little brain has been filled with little symbols. And what it's been filled with is my anticipation of what's going to happen if I fulfill that movement and hit the dog. Here's what's going on, is that I am looking at myself through her eyes. Another famous dead sociologist called it the looking glass self. The looking glass self. A famous professor at the University of Michigan who's long gone as well. Um, the looking glass self. And it means that the way I have a sense of myself is by seeing my, how I'm being reflected in the eyes of others. And so here I'm about to hit the dog this neighbor will think that I am an animal hater, a disrespecter of her as my neighbor, um, a one who does not love a charming dog like Daiquiri. What kind of a mean, and after all she's done for me, uh, baking me brownies, uh, and many other truly good, wonderful things, uh, she now will see me uh, for what I am, an ingrateful, bastard. And so, I'm exaggerating, uh, and so I see that w she will see that. Do you get it? I see what she will see. And that stops my arm. So, what's happened here is, is that there isn't a distinction between what I think, what I am, and what I do. It is through the doing, in this case, me swiping the dog, that these thoughts came into my brain about what she will see. And then the next move I make, which is to wave to her rather than hit the dog, is formed through the self I am creating. Now, George Herbert Mead used a somewhat technical vocabulary that we've picked up for this. It's not crazy technical. It's, in fact, very simple. He used the terms the I and the me. The I and the me. The I is, is, the, is a subject. I act, the thing that acts. And the me, it's just the English grammar, the me is an object. It's the objective form of self. Me is the object. So I, the active piece starts to make this move, but I see the object 
in my path as I'm about to do it. And that object comes from the anticipated viewpoint of other human beings. And that stops me. So in a way, I is moving forward, the active part, but I see, I glimpse I, the me, which is the part of self that acts, that is an in objective form, is an object. In this, and, and it's an object created by the evaluations of others toward what the, this person is about to do. Okay, now are you starting to get the picture? What this means is, is that, well, to, to get right to it, we're all interlinked. Our sense of self is formed through the evaluations of others. And I am, and each of you are, in effect, an accumulation of those evaluations that others have provided as you interpret them to be. So you're a collection of your mother's and father's moments of saying good boy, bad boy, good girl, bad girl. So you're slow at this, you're fast at that. You're moral, you're immoral, you're irresponsible, you were good to your grandmother, you were bad to your grandmother. All of these things are the kind of uh, accretions uh, that build up over our being, over our biographies. And here's the radical punchline, we are nothing but that. That is, our self are those things. So let's contrast this with a lot of sort of um, um, uh, amateur psychology and pop psychology, which constantly talks about being your true self, right? Don't, don't go with that boyfriend. Uh, don't uh, become uh, a doctor. Uh, don't become a poet. Do become a poet. Whatever. D move to Chicago. Don't move to Chicago. Be true to yourself. Don't let these others influence you. Well, that won't wash in this, set, in this way of understanding how the world works. How the world works, what we are and indeed how we could be, how there could be a self. There is no other way for you to have a sense of self to fill in that empty box apart from your interaction with others. That's where it comes from. So there is no true self apart from the social self. And the social self exists through these interactions with other people who are constantly laying stuff on us, as we like to say. But we can't live without these other people laying stuff on us. That stuff on us is us. And it is the only way we have a sense of self that we can have any integrity in the world um, whatsoever. So now are the words making sense a little bit? I hope they're gathering up a little bit of, of steam. Symbolic interaction. That's what's going on, and I'm going to give you some more um, ways of uh, thinking about that. It's not just to summarize where we are. Um, we anticipate action, through our actions, we anticipate the reactions of others that changes the actions that we actually, um, that we actually carry on. So it's not thinking versus action, action versus thinking. Action and thinking are part of the same process. The self is always evolving because at any given moment and in the smallest way, the evaluations of others are accumulating on us and we're sensitive to it. You're sitting there right now, perhaps next to another person. If that person is taking up like on an airplane, just one quarter of an inch of your space, you are annoyed at that person who can't respect yourself, your space, and who are they to think about you that way, and who are you to think about them that way. If someone is nudging you right now, taking up your little too much space on your armrest, there is this awareness and sensibility. We never stop. That's the point. 
we are constantly, as we live our life, no time out, gathering up impressions from others and refining, constantly refining what we are, who we are. It drives us forward towards social interaction. It drives us away in that we get burned, but that's life. Life is a job. This ain't easy. Uh, nobody said it would be a picnic, um, but it's the dynamic uh, that uh, makes us get up in the morning and probably makes us want to go to sleep at night and in severe cases causes us to withdraw um, and in radical ways sometimes even suicide. So this is a way of, of thinking about self, self and others. It's not self versus others. Self and others are part of the pr same process. It's not thinking versus action. Self, thought, others, action is a single thing. It is a process, not a thing. I use the word thing. Um, it's not. It's a process. And it's a process that thus generates conformity. Because if you don't do the right thing uh, as interpreted by uh, your mother, your father, your, uh, your, 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 your mates in the dormitory, your teachers, your, um, uh, your, the captain of your team, whatever it might be, your teammates, if you don't do the right thing, they will think badly of you and you anticipate precisely how they'll feel um, as best you can, uh, as best you can, which is not always, uh, which is not always so easy. So it means that we can have something like social order in the world because we're all anticipating what others will think. And that means we don't go running off doing crazy, nutty things vis-a-vis -vis the culture and the society in which we are in. So if you're in a culture or society that is a duck-oriented one, you will do ducks because otherwise you will be considered a bunny kind of renegade. If you are in India and the sacred cows are walking around and you grab a newspaper and start um, shooing or pummeling or hurting that cow, then you are a bad person and you know that that is what will be delivered to you. So it's not morality from a biblical message from the Quran, from the Ten Commandments. It isn't anything like that. The basis of social solidarity, of moral behavior, of of, uh, is, is, the, is the need to get along. We go along to get along. And, uh, and, and what is at stake is our very sense of self. So this is a profound kind of set of ideas of what is, um, of what is happening as we engage in symbolic interaction uh, with other human beings. So, uh, for people who follow in the footsteps of, 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 of this kind of way of thinking of symbolic interaction and in George Herbert Mead, they have tried to systematize this in various ways. And one of the ways is to say that some people are more significant to us than others. We now use the term significant other um, in ordinary English language to imply a uh, boyfriend or girlfriend or something like that. Um, on party invitations. Do people still do that? Bring your significant other? Do they say that? You've heard it. Okay, well this is another case where the sociology word has become part of common English language. That word comes from the, um, and that term comes from this theory of the symbolic interactionists. And, what, and, it, and it, they came up with this term in order to say that all people are not equal to all of us in the power that they have to uh, shape how we think about ourselves. That some people are more significant than others. And the people who do this kind of work call it, those are the significant others. Uh, and they are significant in that regard. They have control over your sense of self. Then there are people who are relevant. Uh, they are not um, critical, but they count um, in a way that others, other people don't count. So if I, let's say I said to you that um, uh, the students in this room, your co-students, 
uh, think that the way uh, you acted uh, when you uh, raised your hand um, in class and made that speech about how you were captain of your basketball team um, when you were in high school, that that really was stupid. Um, the, that counts because all of you are, are relevant to each other and your opinions count in some way. They don't make or break you, but they count in some way. Uh, as opposed to, for example, if I said um, how the, um, how the, how, how, uh, the uh, leading factions in Iran regard the fact that uh, you women in the class uh, walk around um, and uh, wear tight, tight clothes and you let your hair be seen. Um, and I think your attitude is, yeah, so it has no dent, uh, no dent whatever. So they're, not, they're irrelevant others. They're certainly not relevant others. Well, what also happens is, is that some people are relevant um, because they are members of a group who really matter to you. And in fact, I used that example just a minute ago without realizing it. So the other st the students at NYU uh, are, in a way, a reference group. What are students at NYU doing? In a way that, say, what are terrorists up to these days is not a reference group. You don't look to terrorists in the, wherever they might be to get your cues as to what kind of person you, you need to be because of how they might think about you. So without thinking about the specific individuals involved, you probably have a vague idea of what, um, uh, what, what sociology majors in general will think of you uh, if you, for example, uh, declare you're a Republican. Uh, I can clue you in. Uh, they'll think you're odd um, and that uh, you're probably not really a sociology major uh, after all. Uh, they'll suspect something, like you're from Stern uh, or, God knows, or God knows what else. So um, you have reference groups who uh, you have a sense of what they in general think um, and you may shape your behavior to those groups more than to other groups that uh, you care less about because they, and it then, it then is the case that they have less control over your soul, over your being, over your notion of yourself. And then finally, there is what the symbolic interactionists call the generalized other. And that just means that somehow it is so in the air that if we're in India, of course, it, it's not about whether this human being, that person, that neighbor, uh, thinks that uh, cows are um, special creatures who need to be respected. It's, it's what everybody thinks. And so I just know in a general kind of way that if I act in a certain way, they won't like it. So our they is our general understanding of the cultural others. Uh, they won't like it. Uh, we generalize um, without having to think about the specifics of which types of individuals, which type of groups. In the world in which we, we live, we know they, uh, anybody will think that somebody who does that is not a cool person. And I don't want to be a non-cool person. And so I will, um, I, I will go along. So that's the story. Significant others, relevant others, reference groups, and generalized other, they're ways of just sort of uh, disaggregating, making distinctions within this process, however, in which uh, what is at stake, what is at stake is our, is our being, our sense of self. And according to Mead's theory, there's a kind of behavioral push to it, which is that the behavioral push is that this drive, and there I've just used an almost biological word, that when we think about why we do things, what's the, the animus, if we're wind-up toys, what's the mechanism, what's the wind-up? And the wind-up is to seek a positive sense of self, that sociology is not big on instincts. We, don't, we think animals follow instinct. 
Um, and some biologists think that human beings follow instincts. And to some degree, maybe they do. Uh, but for sociologists, what we're interested in is not the instinct part, but the non-instinct part. And so then, what, what is for us the basic drive? Uh, we do acknowledge hunger, food, sex. We do think those things count. But they're not interesting to us as drives. What is interesting to us as a kind of drive is the seeking of a positive sense of self. We each want to believe in ourselves, and we go to great lengths to do that, to have a positive sense of self. And that's what all this social interaction is doing for us. It means that we're uh, going about it that way. Now think about, we'll just jump ahead of the course a little bit, think about what that means in terms of other people's theories. So for example, Sigmund Freud, the psychologist, of uh, many would say the founder of modern psychology. For Sigmund Freud, there are drives that are biologically based that shape how we, how we think and what we think about and what, how we behave. It's all emanating from some deep circumstance and maybe our earliest um, infant experiences uh, with our key caregivers. And then the little machinery is set in motion and out comes a human being um, as living their lives uh, anxious about their mother's breast or anxious about their toilet training uh, or such, this one thing. Or for Karl Marx, where it's all about economic betterment, that is the drive for money, the drive to increase domination and wealth over another person. That's the core basic drive of human beings. And virtually all economists have something like that as what's pushing people on. For me, that's not what's pushing people on. The core push is to get this positive sense of self. And it leaves open how you might get that. You might get it by, for example, making a lot of money and buying a fabulous car or buying a helicopter or whatever else. And people will admire you and say, well, aren't you great? But it also might be by serving humanity, by becoming a nun, by working at the soup kitchen. Maybe that's the way. Or, in fact, martyrdom, committing suicide, and taking along with you, say, another 40, 80, 200, 3,000 people. That is the way you develop a positive sense of self. So, this theory of symbolic interaction and George Herbert Mead leaves a range of possibilities as to why people behave and what generates um, the kind of uh, activities that we um, see, uh, see are around us all the time. Well, let's get back to this uh, mechanism of forming self and mechanism of, 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 of um, individuation um, and yet um, uh, conforming. So I, I just want to emphasize that. Although I've been using the word conforming a great deal, what also is going on is individuation. So one of the things that people sometimes worry about is the contrast, the opposition, between the individual and society. I've referred to that contrast. And what symbolic interaction does is it, it, it is eliminating that contrast. It's trying to say, no, 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 there isn't this kind of contrast. That in creating the individual, you're creating society. And at the same time, society is creating the individual. I've been using the word conformity. But in fact, in a way, it's obvious that's not the whole story either. Because each of us is different from every one of us. We are all individuals. How can I do that? How can I save the, the individual? Uh, when I've just discussed how, in fact, we're all just sort of putty in each other's hands and conforming to uh, the significant others, the relevant others, the reference, uh, the reference groups, and the generalized other. Well, the answer is, is that each pathway toward this evolving sense of self is different. There, there, is no, um, there is no sense of self dictator who's 
pulling the strings, who's organizing us. That's not the way. Each of us in this room is going to walk out these doors and run into somebody different. And that somebody different is going to say, oh, uh, I like your glasses. When would you get them? Uh, or I heard you got a B plus in, in calculus. And I know that was a challenge for you. That's great. And somebody else is going to get something else. And somebody else is going to get a dirty look. And somebody else is going to be told, no, they're not going to go out with them next weekend. Um, and you're going to think, oh, it's because I'm ugly. Uh, or whatever. And so each of us then, because in a way our root, our social root, our interaction uh, location, uh, our pathway is different from every other, is going to evolve in different ways. And we make choices along that path where we say, no, I'm, uh, I'm dropping out of NYU. This was a stupid idea in the first place. I'm going to Cornell where I can be in a place with lawns. And that's where I'm going. And I'm not going to be with these kinds of people here anymore. Uh, or I'm not going to be with that um, uh, girlfriend, boyfriend, uh, or that religion. I'm out of here. And in that way, we shape ourselves in a way, get from one, jump from one lifeboat onto another lifeboat. But that lifeboat is always going to be of the same sort, which is this um, set of other human beings through which we make up who we are and who we make up in turn. We're all connected. There's something zen-like I've always found about this because it means that all us human beings are in an interconnected web of shaping the being of every one of other human beings. It's, I think, um, has a, a, a zen-like quality to it in which we are all one, as it were, even as we are each one distinct uh, and unique uh, from all the others. Well, a couple of your um, authors I found con convenient or helpful um, in spinning off and elaborating um, some of these ideas. Because when we talk about, for example, different uh, reference groups um, and the way uh, groups form, that starts advancing us into the next sections of the course where the, uh, uh, the power and significance of things beyond the individual start mattering a lot. And later on in the course, there's a section on race and ethnicity. And so we're anticipating that section a little bit. But by, through the writings of a, um, of a, a sociologist, of a scholar uh, named W.E.B. Uh, du Bois, um, no longer alive as well, uh, you can see he lived a long, long life in which an enormous number of things happened. Um, and he's famous for numbers of books, numbers of works. And in fact, he wrote uh, 22 books off the, over the course of his life. And one of them is The Souls of Black Folk, which is um, on your reading list. The reason why I put it in this section and wanted to discuss it at the same time I talk about George Herbert Mead is that within Mead's vocabulary, which uh, Du Bois did not use, um, his uh, intellectual tradition was somewhat different, but within Du Bois' vocabulary, um, uh, there is a kind of orientation to George Herbert Mead. And indeed, they were contemporaries so, uh, for part of the time, so it, um, it does make sense. Um, and that is this idea of double consciousness. So a way to talk about double consciousness is to say that for African Americans, and uh, Du Bois was an African American, uh, the, the first, by the way, African-American to get a PhD from Harvard University, one of the first probably to get a PhD from anywhere um, in the United States, but uh, the, in fact, the very first from Harvard. Um, for um, uh, for W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, the critical f fact of his life is that he is an African-American, a Negro. And, uh, that means that he's living in a world which is basically divided between two sets of human beings, white people and black people. And he's writing at a time and coming of age at a time before 
we had other um, mass migrations to worry about, especially in the American East Coast. He didn't live in the West, so he doesn't uh, have that as part of his orientation of the world. So as for many other Americans, there are two kinds of uh, people in the racial world, uh, black people and white people. And um, he is aware of how aware he is of white people and what white people think about black people. And he's saying, therefore, that, and he's saying this is asymmetric because white people don't particularly care what black people think about them. So for black people, white people are an important reference group. But for black people, white people are just a kind, uh, excuse me, for white people, black people are kind of irrelevant in terms of this dynamic of forming sense of self. So, the soul of black folk. You can think of the word soul as the, as the self in the George Herbert Mead sense. He is saying that an ongoing, an ongoing phenomenon of consciousness of black people is the fact of white people and what white people make of black people. And he thinks that this is a source of oppression that it is a source of damage, it is a source of complication, and it is a burden. So other people can walk into a room, interact with people, and only have a kind of single consciousness. For, uh, for Du Bois, there is a double consciousness. You're thinking about yourself, but you're thinking about yourself and your people, black people, always within, within the framework of what white people might make of it. And so he says about um, the Negro, born with a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world, a world which, yield, which yields him no true self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world. Can you hear the influence of George Herbert Mead in that? Uh, no true self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself, only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body, and so forth and so on. Now, for our class, this idea of double consciousness should not be so strange, because what, I'm, what I've tried to prepare you for before greeting this idea of double consciousness is that all of us have multiple consciousness. That it doesn't come neat. I was using examples like, what does your mother think? What do your father think? What do your grandparents think? What do your buddies think? Your, your dorm pals, or your high school friends, they don't all think the same thing. Some of them think that you should go to the dance and get stoned. And some of them think, think no, you should go and help take care of your grandfather because he needs you now, or that you should study for your midterm in sociology. That's your primary duty in this world. So all of these different things are at war with each other. And we've got to, through our interpretive capacities, we've got to grapple with that. And I used the term last time from the social psychologists that there were, in fact, I think I used that, there were cross pressures. Yes, I did when we talked about the Milgram experiment. There are cross pressures. And these cross, cross pressures come from the fact that you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. The psychologists call it a double bind. You can't win. And we're all, we all know those moments, those circumstances. That is indeed a great problem. And it's because of the fact that we can't please all our relevant others, all our reference groups at once. And so we're walking around thinking about, well, what will they think? What will they think? What do they think? What do they think? And that's enough to drive you crazy. And it does drive people, some people, 
absolutely and utterly mad. But now we enter into the language of W.E.B. Du Bois, who says, wait a minute, there's something systematic about this. It's not just you and your grandmother and you and your dates and you and your this and you and your that, but it kind of comes in packages. It's a package deal. And if you are African American, in addition to thinking about what does your mother think, your father think, your brother think, and all of that, you have to think, what do white people think? How will this uh, create um, something disparaging uh, about me because I'm black? Uh, how will this influence their attitudes toward black people in general and me in particular? That's a kind of load that his idealized white person doesn't have because they may have all these other little balancing acts, but black people carry all of that plus this other big deal. And when you read the, this article, you will see this piece. It's just a chapter of, of his book, of one of his books. You will see him trying to indicate um, in just a little bit that you read. Of course, you should read more W.B. Du Bois if you're interested in this. Uh, you will see the ways in which it does damage to the group um, and creates um, crises in their lives. And uh, Du Bois was interested in explaining black, uh, black crime. He was interested in explaining education. He had uh, ideas about how education should be reformed. Um, and um, uh, there, there he is. Uh, uh, th that's good, I didn't mention that. Du Bois was also, besides being a, an academic, who, who taught, by the way, uh, at the uh, Negro colleges, which is the only places that uh, would have him, um, despite his brilliance. And I think just reading this small piece will give you an idea of his brilliance. But he was one of the founders of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, which is um, arguably the most important civil rights organization uh, we've, had, uh, we've had in American history. He became very discouraged uh, toward the end of his long life that there would ever be appropriate reform on race relations in the United States and moved to Ghana. Uh, and um, the students here who go to NYU Accra will see um, institutions that are there as a result of uh, Du Bois having spent the last part of his life. There's um, a, a, a memorial to him, um, a library um, institution. Now, um, how else does it work? So what I've given you is the way in which, um, for Du Bois, reference groups and all this process of forming self are, are organized by groups. Um, someone who really didn't think much about groups, but did think very much in the tradition of symbolic interaction and was very schooled in it, nothing, uh, uh, nothing uh, coincidental there, um, is this guy, Irving Goffman, um, who did not have a very long life, um, became president of the American Sociological Association, uh, um, was elected but uh, never served because he died um, before he could do that. Um, Goffman taught at Berkeley um, and the University of Pennsylvania. And um, he's known for his many, many books which examine micro-interaction and how it is that micro-interaction takes place uh, and, um, it, and people perform in a kind of orderly and appropriate way um, as a result of their need to provide themselves with a positive sense of self by accumulating the positive ev evaluations of others. Goffman didn't exactly use that language, but it's something like that that I think gets across what he was, what he was up to. So for Goffman, there is a kind of backstage in which we uh, prepare our performances. And Goffman used the language of the theater quite a lot. And you all know your Shakespeare uh, all the world's a stage, and we're but actors upon it. Well, everything I told you about George Herbert Mead, and then, in fact, uh, reading also, uh, following up with um, Du Bois, th there's a lot of performing in all of that. In fact, I think for George Herbert Mead, 
We are nothing apart from our performances. Uh, these are the critical ways in which we uh, win the audience uh, to our side. And by winning the audience to our side, we create ourselves in a way that we can live with as positive enough to go on from day to day. So how does Goffman say we do it in a micro way? Well, I gave you some examples when I talked about your sticking your elbow a little bit too much close to the student who's next to you. Uh, or maybe you engage in some a major snoring uh, while the lecture is going on. We've all been at lectures where uh, someone's bothering us this way or playing with their cell phone or whatever else. There's all sorts of things that we do that disturb other human beings. Goffman says that as we go through our life, we, we prepare our performances backstage and then we take those performances front stage. The backstage might be our bathroom when we're all alone and we're fixing our hair. The backstage may be the way we um, organize our clothing to go out. We can do a survey here. Um, there's a sociologist uh, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania who asked his students, and he's accumulated data over the years uh, at, in Philadelphia, how many of them, before they go out, um, let's say on a date, change their clothes. That is, they, they, they put on a set of clothes to go out, and then they take them off and put on another set of clothes. Uh, and then they take them off and put on still another set of clothes. So I want to do a survey here. I want to know how many of you have ever done one of those things. That is that it's time to go out, you put on some clothes, and then you decide, no, I'm not going to wear those clothes. I'm going to wear another set of clothes. Raise your hand if you've ever done that. OK, almost everybody. Thank you very much. Now, how many of you have done it twice? You put on a set of clothes, and nah, I don't like those. You put on another set of clothes, and you're like, nah, I still don't like these. And then you put on still another set of clothes. OK, so you're now in your third set, but your second going out set. Raise your hand if you've ever done that. We have quite a few people who have uh, raised their hand. Now. Uh, that's consistent. I can't remember the number, but, but for his students at the University of Pennsylvania, two, three, four, five times uh, is what people do commonly. And contrary to the stereotype, the young men do it as well. They don't do it as many times, but it isn't true that they just go out. Uh, I notice, by the way, sometimes in the men's room now, if I see any of you in the men's room, you're going to be very wary of this. Wear this. When women um, look in the mirror, I never watch them in women's rooms, but I watch them in life. Uh, when women uh, are in front of the mirror, they're with each other and they're like going like this and like this. And how do you like it now? How do you like it now? Uh, I like it a little more there, a little more there, like that, right? And in the men's rooms, uh, men don't do that uh, because they don't care. Uh, but what you see is is that as they're going out and maybe zipping up, you know, their eyes are on the mirror, and then they quickly go, whatever they're going to do. Um, like, on the run. Like, they don't care. And that's a kind of gender difference. But what it points out is that the presentation of self takes place, the backup job takes place in this quasi-private space. The public toilet, of course, is not so private. Uh, but compared to what happens outside, um, and that it's influenced by many things, including gender and exactly how they do that. But the, the young men, the men, uh, young or old, um, are also preparing presentation. And part of that presentation is the presentation of not caring about the presentation. And that's what's done with that precise repertoire of gesture that I tried to capture in what I was doing, um, what I was doing here. Here's my favorite, one of my favorite examples uh, from Goffman. Um, he doesn't use exactly this one. I make it up a little bit as I go. But if you're in the library, say you're in Bopst, and somebody is um, at the stacks, you're sitting at one of those um, desks, and you hear a crashing of books. And it's because somebody has inadvertently knocked over uh, a section of books, or knocked over some books from uh, from their uh, 
uh, from their shelf, and I'm uh, just as I'm talking to you, and I get a little uh, nervous, and I fidget, and I'm going like that. Oops. Okay, now, that word, oops, is supposed to be a meaningless word. Uh, you won't find it uh, when you study English, if you're uh, studying from the French or the Italian. Uh, oops is not in the, in the, in the vocabulary. Uh, it's probably in the dictionary, I don't know, but we think of it as not a word at all. Maybe even we think of it as involuntary, that somehow the O's lead to the P, lead to the S at the moment of the shock. Well, for Goffman, there's something very meaningful about oops. And what oops is doing is that it is saying to somebody, uh, anybody who might be around, I am in control. It seems as though you may suspect that there is a random madman uh, going through Bobst, uh, which does happen uh, here in New York, quite conceivable. Uh, but that's not what you're hearing. So you can relax. You can get back to your book, your notes, your work. Everything's cool. Everything's OK. And the word oops is the display that I know what seemed happened was weird uh, or may seem weird and that you might be concerned that I am a crazy person. Well, relax, you're not. I'm not. Uh, and, and so you can uh, go back to thinking that you are in the presence of a competent NYU human being. All's all right. That's what OOPS is doing. And that analysis of OOPS comes from Goffman. And it's to say that, to show that, every move we make uh, and in ways that uh, we don't advertise are indeed presenting self. And one of the things we do when we present self, driven as we are by this zeal for goal of being seen as competent um, and a positive sense of ourselves for our own thinking about ourselves, is one of the things that we're doing is creating the capacity for us to be together. Because you see, if we were constantly worried about everybody in our environment, in Bobst, being a crazy person, if I had to worry, and you had to worry, about each person in this room being a kind of random actor, uh, like, a, like the crazy people we do sometimes run into in New York, say on the subway, um, especially if they've not had their prescription, uh, and they are kind of loose on the, on the scene, it means that we can't do our thing. We can't listen to our, our, our iPhone. Um, we, we have to uh, be wary and attentive uh, and we won't want to use this subway car. We may not even want to use the subway system. And indeed, people pulled away from using the subway system uh, when there was a lot of erratic um, and screwy behavior in which people couldn't depend on the conforming moves of other human beings. And the reason we give those conforming, human being, th those conforming moves is that we are engaged in this process of developing a positive sense of self uh, through the eyes of other human beings. That's what, um, that's what we're up to as we um, move through the world. Goffman used the term, no time out. That as we do this behavior, if, if, you, take, if you take a moment out, th that blows the whole thing. You can't go into the library um, and say, uh, just a simple thing, like take off your shirt. Um, only take you a moment and put it right back on. If one of you saw someone you uh, know from this class doing that, uh, that move would be just the oddest thing. Or suppose this, suppose you're in the cafeteria uh, and, uh, or, or in a restaurant, and you see, uh, and you're next to someone, one of the students uh, that you recognize vaguely from NYU but you don't know, and they reach over and take one of your french fries. It's, it's a small thing. You don't care about the french fries. They're spilling out anyway. I mean, when they're putting them in the thing, some of them are falling off onto the tray and, or onto the floor or whatever. What's another french fry? But if somebody reached in and took that french fry, it'd be like, oh my god. Uh, you know, what kind of a person am I dealing with? And what kind of a random world am I dealing with? So that would create problems. 
So Goffman says, for another great concept from Goffman, he speaks of civil inattention. And my, there are a few students here who've had my other class know about this. Civil inattention. So um, here's what we do as we make our lives. As you're walking through the streets of New York, um, if, when you're on the subways, uh, even in, as you're coming and going from this classroom, you manage your eyes in a very careful way. So, and I manage my eyes in a very careful way. So you're all looking at me, but I'm this poor young woman in the red sweater. I am just looking at her, and she's not liking it. Uh, it's an issue. And the reason is, is that even as I look across this class, there are a few seconds where I can be looking at your face, and anything longer is like weird. Because what's he up to? Does he think I'm cheating? Does he think I'm, um, um, I'm a problem child in some way? Uh, uh, is, he, is this flirtation? And that's what happens when you're on the street, of course, is that anything longer than, say, a second or so is something else is going on here. Something else. We don't know what, but something else is going on here. And it could be that this is a crazy person, because crazy people do stare at us, and they don't know to, to do civil inattention. They, they just keep staring, which is just bad. And it's something we have to then move away from. Uh, and other people are not crazy, but they're up to something, or so we start thinking. And if they're not up to something, they must be crazy. Up to something, i.e., uh, they uh, want to date us, or they think we stole their iPod last year, or something plausible like that. Uh, otherwise, it's just, it's just bizarre. This capacity to look only for a second or two, except when we do mean business of some kind, uh, is an amazing skill. Just like walking together on the street is an amazing skill. And we all have it. And we have it because there's no time out. That is, this capacity that Goffman's talked about, this capacity to uh, take the role of the other, and that's a phrase that we use a lot in sociology. Take the role of the other. What will it look like if I do that in their eyes and come back to me as what I am? This capacity to take the role of the other, even at this minute level of holding a glance, of managing it only for a second or so, except when I mean business of a certain sort or so. And then, of course, it's not just staring blank. It's, not, it's just instead of one second, maybe it's three seconds. And that then suspect causes them to think, maybe he means something, she means something by this look. And then I have the choice to give it back just a little longer. And we have a flirtation. We may have a date. Uh, we may have a marriage. We may have a bonding. Uh, we may have two significant others uh, forming as, as one. Well, um, we're moving toward uh, the end of this great um, conversation in which I've tried to explain how individuation occurs, how social order is made possible, um, yet in the same way that each individual is unique. And now we come to, in a way, uh, another way of summarizing what symbolic interaction is. It's the interaction of symbols. That's just like that language says. Um, but it's an interaction of symbols which makes possible mind, which is an uh, interaction. In our mind is interaction. Our mind is not a thing. It's not stable. It is in constant flux. And that flux is made possible by the human beings um, and the objects, which are social symbols. All words are social agreements, that it means this and it doesn't mean that. So the mind is an interaction of symbols. The self is an interaction. It is these individuals um, in relationship to me that are forming who I am. So for me to have a sense of self, for there to be a self, there must be human interaction. Otherwise, I die alone uh, in the old age home 
or in the, uh, in the nursery uh, for, for, for infants. And then society is interaction. Uh, what is society but the sum of all of these pieces, of all of these creatures in their interacting glory uh, that uh, yield up um, uh, making up the individuals as those individuals make up society, as those, that society makes up those individuals. And so it is all uh, one, one grand process. So that's the, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that is the theory of symbolic interaction. It is one of the significant um, orientations in sociology. It is particularly used by ethnographers who do qualitative sociology. Um, it's harder to quantify and play with in quantitative terms, but as we'll see as we move along in the semester, that sometimes has happened as well. So uh, that's it for today. Have a great Wednesday, and I'll see you on Thursday.